two more seconds. I'm going to be able to check off your report card as well for all curriculum. Perfect attendance. It's going to be a little bit of a small group tonight. This is it, but I'm happy with the group that's here, so thank you for attending. This is the last of this block of the First Cut series. Tonight we're going to focus on roast and the holiday a little bit. We're going to keep it loose so that you can kind of just relax and take a little bit hopefully a few nuggets of knowledge away from uh, what's going on. Michael Buckley, owner operator of the Venture Meat Company, if you're not sure who he is. And this is Nick, our, our new chop man. And uh, you'll see why he's very skilled with his blades, uh, very precise, and he's gonna lead us through a couple demos. Uh, this is Mr. Chuck Terra as well, he's from Food Share. And a portion of all of our events goes back to Food Share. So by you being here tonight, there's other individuals in need who will benefit from your learning and participation, so we appreciate that. There's some marketing materials on the table, as always. Uh, if you're interested in ever volunteering with them or helping out in future, there's also a sign-in sheet where they can send you some information via email. Uh, every dollar that they bring in, well, obviously food and canned donations are a benefit to them, but every dollar of donation that gets brought in can also be leveraged to a little over $5 worth of assistance to those individuals in need. So again, portion of this event definitely goes a long way, so thank you for that, especially around the holidays. Tonight, we're gonna to lead through a little bit of a progression. So we're not gonna jump right into the demos. Uh, we wanna talk about these cuts of meat, where they're at on the animal a little bit, and some of the movement of that animal, why are we tough or tender. Uh, very similar to some of the items that we talked about in the breaking down your beef class. But then we also wanna move into some cooking techniques for these different roasts, and what's appropriate, why certain things work. And then Nick will take over to show us how to tie up a good beef roast, as well as how to create a pork crown roast. So you can go home and while you're family and friends this holiday. Uh, Michael, let's talk about, again, a little bit of the placement on the animals first and describe which of the roads we have out here. Yeah. We brought on a variety. Yeah, we did because, uh, you know, people have a lot of different ideas on what they want to prepare for the holidays. Uh, and you just get a little bit of narrow vision because the biggest recommendation is the, the beef standing rib roast known as 
prime rib. It's got a million different names. Standing rib roast, export rib. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to go. And, and I just brought a few different things out to kind of show that you can really get a nice presentation and a really nice meal without having to go with, you know, something like the, the prime rib or standing rib roast. But that's what we have here. And, uh, you know, it seems daunting. It's not. This is bone in ribeye. This is the tip. If we boned this out, these would become beef back ribs, and then we would have boneless ribeye, which you could just cut into steaks any size. So that's really all we have here is just a bone in rib to be prepared as a roast instead of steaks. Uh, so the, you know, the properties of, of a ribeye, the reason it's such a popular steak is the marbling. It's going to make for a very nice roast because the fat will liquefy, it will add to a lot of flavor, and it will keep it from getting dried out. Uh, moving on, we have a little rack of lamb here, very similar cut to the uh, to the ribeye. This is the rib of a lamb. Obviously, it's a much smaller animal, but same idea. You know, this could be you wouldn't really see this be deboned very often. Usually, this would be cut into like lamb chops or something, uh, but lovely prepared as a roast. Uh, they do leave eight bones on the uh, on the lamb rack, which is a little different than the uh, than the rib. This has a couple taken off of it, but the, the the beef rib has seven ribs. The lamb rack has eight. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, same properties here, though. A lot of fat in there, as you can see. This is uh, all ready to go in a dry roast in the oven. Won't need a lot of help. There'll be a lot of flavor there. Moving on, we have uh, the loin, bone-in loin off of a, uh, you know, a pork bone-in loin. Very similar as well. Uh, we're not dealing with the same, the way that these are similar, this is not as similar. It's cut a little differently. Um, well, this is much... Show the word is on the animal. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually. You can see the center cut loin is what that particular cut comes off of. And that's a very long uh, cut of meat, whereas the rib, as you can see on a cow, it's from, as, the, it's from near towards the shoulder area, whereas right. the loin is towards the butt of the animal. Almost where you're looking at the meat, right? No, not the butt. That's the wrong <laughs> right. So um, this, again, is something that can be dry roasted. Temperature. Uh, cooking temperature. You're targeting 170. 
and it was a personal preference for him. 170 is 10 degrees higher than what's recommended as a safe temperature for pork. And when we talk about a safe temperature, that's also kind of a personal preference um, in the sense that it's a recommended temperature, but you go by the Pork Association, they'll bring it down. So 160 is what's often publicized. My father-in-law targeted 170 because that's we wanted a little more done and that's his preference. But also when we talk about again the pork association, they say we can bring it down as low as 145 and allow for another three to five minutes of resting time. And that will go up a couple of degrees during that resting time. What ended up happening, um, just based on the temperature portion of my example, the upper outer edges of the pork brown roast were dry. And they're very well cooked to a fault. Um, the great browning, it looked gorgeous, but it was a little dry. And then down below, in the inner lower portion of the ring of the crown roast, it was undercooked a little bit based on his goal. Now it wasn't, when we talk about those lower temperatures, that 145 to 150. It was more medium rare, about medium. So it was very tender and delicious down there, but it was dry and kind of mealy up at the edges. The second portion of that, and we were talking about possibly stuffing roast, is he actually stuffed his before he cooked it. I don't recommend that. He did a, a really delicious dirty rice that he put in the middle, but he put it in at the beginning of the cooking cycle to let them cook together. And that's also part of why there was uneven cooking. So there was a lot of insulation and shielding in the middle of that pork crown roast, which prevented that lower inner ring from cooking at the same rate as the outer ring of the, the roast itself. I personally recommend doing, if you're gonna fill it, do that on the side and put it in the center of your roast for presentation. Don't cook them together. Allow that roast to cook at a very even rate and allow the, the full roast to get the attention it deserves. It's the same thing that we talked about with the turkey. I actually have something yeah. opposite to say about that. Well, when I, I actually made a stuffed chicken recently, I deboned a chicken and then I stuffed it with some rice as well. And what I did was I first buttered the outside and then I roasted it at a higher temperature, you know, 425 for like 10 minutes and brown the skin. And I reduced it down to 325 and cooked for two hours. Did you wrap it in foil? No, I did not. Okay. I just kept the skin on and had the butter on there and then reduced the temperature way down low so that my reaction wouldn't really happen for a long period of time. So by browning it initially, I got the crispness. And then by turning it down to a lower temperature, I just kind of dried it out and held that crispness. But sort of cooked it low and slow on the inside. And it all got to a juicy, moist temperature about I think it was 160. And then I pulled it out to rest for 10 minutes. The juices, you know, came back into the muscle. The muscles sure. relaxed again. Did you, did you reuse the stuffing? No, the or stuffing was stayed in there. It was the flavor. All right, moisture. The rice was already cooked. I okay. did like a raisin turmeric rice and just stuffed it in there and then cooked it at 165 after I tied it. Interesting. And or sorry, 325 after I tied it and took it out in two hours. How it's long did that pork roast take? He at 170. Was what he was shooting for. Yeah, and he cooked it for two and a half. What temperature did you cook it at? Three and a quarter. Three and a quarter? Yeah. Well, that's the biggest difference. Your chicken's not going to take nearly as long as that. Yeah, well, then you need to reduce the temperature down from four to four, like three, sure. 15, for 10. And the other thing that we always talk about that's debatable is the use of stuffing in the raw, especially yeah. when we're talking about poultry. Yeah. Because you have to make sure that, that stuffing in the center gets up at the same time at a safe temp as the chicken. Well, and then you just take your temperature in the thigh or yeah, the center exactly. of the breast so you know that it's in the center of the bird. That's a good segue. So we're talking about checking the temperature. When we look at these different roasts, obviously yes. they're different sizes, different shapes, because some are bone in and some are not. Show us, Nick, the appropriate place to take a temperature on each of the roasts. So for this one right here, considering you've got the large portion on this side right here, you got a lot of collagen banding right here, should probably take your temperature somewhere into the center, into the middle, probably right around here. Go down into the center of the piece until you hit right about there. So just stick it down in, in there. The pork roast, of course, thick part again. Drive it through the fat, probably up here. You don't want to go straight in through here too much. It ruins presentation and all. You don't want to be too close to the bone either. Exactly. The bone yeah. actually will retain the heat in a different manner than the muscle. Same with, you know, the lamb, you know, in, into the center of the meat, or the bone, and the same here. It's just with the 
sort of pure muscle pets that you want to go into the more thick parts, whereas you know the loins, all loins, are pretty much the same. Just yeah, because it, there's going to be you know different temperatures, different finishing temperatures. This part will be able to accommodate people that like uh, their meat a little more well, whereas the middle can accommodate people that like their meat a little more. Well. Yeah. And one of the things that we didn't talk about too much. Nick's still growing into his. Michael's got his beard. I'm letting my beard grow out. And that's really in honor of the enormity and the mass of these meats. Okay, I want to eat and roast. I want to come on to a big thickness. Yes. What that equates to around the holidays, though, is family-style dining. Okay, we're looking at a large cut of meat that's going to feed, you know, six, eight, ten people where you're presenting. It's not necessarily in a buffet style. You may be carving it to, you know, per person, but you're allowing for a large cut of uh, meat to feed a, a masses. Yeah. With that being said, uh, Nick, I want to focus on this beef roast right here real quick. Yeah. We're talking a lot about presentation. Display is everything for the holidays. People want to have their countertop and their tablecloths. Once you've got the display and it's garnished beautifully, you also want to make sure it's edible. Not just in the cooking, but in the slicing. So can we show the proper kind of direction and slice based on how the muscle is laid out. The bad meat is usually prepared. For Correct. Alright. Um, well, normally you want to cut against the grain of meat because if you go with it, it's sensitive to like fibrous and chewy. And the so, grain I mean, pretty easy to identify. Yeah, it's easy to go in this way. And you can let's tilt it up. I don't want to handle your meat. Um, when you you can see the grain, right? See it's running this way, and then with that silver skin on the back, you can see the striations as well. The muscle fibers are really um, pronounced based on the, the silver skin that's bundling it all together. And with cooking time, it'll sort of melt it together, so it'll be holding its shape a little bit better. And you just want to kind of cut it at an angle against the grain, just kind of thinly slice it carefully, slow, long strokes. And for this kind of meat, what does that that against the bias do for you? You're, you don't have to chew as much. So, I mean, you get little thin strips of cut meat that you don't have to chew too much, which is tender as we perceive it, which is how these sort of tougher roast beefish cuts taste, you know, better. You, you uh, cut with the grain, you end up with a longer muscle fiber that, yeah. you know, really you're not able to break it down in the same way as those short little bits that were sliced. It's, it's a massively overloaded to say. Definitely make sure you're cutting it against the grain. Because I think, especially with this, the way it's cut from the, from you guys, the initial inclination would be to go with it because that's I'm seeing a flat edge and that's right. the side to slice against. But in all actuality, we want to go in the opposite direction that's of what's right. being shown to us right here, so we get that good bias cut. Yeah, if we were portioning this out, a little bit of a different story. I mean, we might, you know, we had. Uh, we had somebody ask for half of this as a roast. We might take that approach there. Different cut when you're portioning it as opposed to uh, serving it. Sure. But it also depends on how they're asking for pairs as well. Right, absolutely. Which is a, a great reason to get in good with your butcher, to know what, kind of trust their advice. Because as you're seeing right now, both these guys know what they're talking about. If you a say, bit, I'm bit. cooking for you also have to know what you want, because yeah. I mean, we'll, we might just end up doing what's kind of easy at the time, because we might be rushed. Right. So we might slice it just boom, and give you kind of an off cut, you have to like really know what you want, and know the way you want to cut it and finish it, so you can ask for specifications, right. so you don't get you know, upset when you get kind of Absolutely. I think as a customer, not as a presenter right, right now, but as a customer. Well, it depends on like, your slices. Slices? Normally you want to do them like maybe an eighth of an inch, like really, really thin, because, you know, it's, just, it's a tough cut. Yes. And so the thinner you make those muscle fibers, because that's the fat and the collagen between the little tiny muscle fibers, and that's what's breaking down in the cooking time, that's the, you know, kind of fatty... No, absolutely. I mean, you, yeah, you cut it too thick and it, it's going to be a little tougher than if you cut it a little thinner. So. Yeah, an eighth of an inch, that's pretty thin, but if you've got a sharp enough knife to do it, why not? It's going to lend Think to of roast beef sandwiches. Yeah, right. And how delicious those are. Or like a Philly cheesesteak. So they have a, a very finely shaped, same kind of thing. And you'll get a very nice. beautiful au jus and gravy to go with your mashed potato. And a really like sharp knife. Sharp knives, which are also knives. safer. They are. 
And when we were talking, when Nick was referencing knowing what you want, you don't have to know what you want to know what you want. It's good information passed to these guys. You may not exactly know, but if you ask good questions or you give them good information, they'll help you figure out the Tell you us do. what you want yeah, and you'll be able to figure it out. All you gotta do is say, I'm putting you for seven people. Right. I wanna be, you know, about four o'clock, I want some kind of beef, I want it to be tender, these are my side dishes. You actually do know what you want without knowing until they guide you in the right direction. I think the first thing that, you know, that we ask is always how many people you're trying to feed. That's the first, we talk about it with, with, with the turkey classes. Uh, once you find out how many people you need to feed, that's going to help you make decisions on what you need to get. Because, you know, if you've got 25 people to feed, you're going to be spending a lot of money on something like this. You know? So then it becomes a more economical thing. And uh, that's always the first question we ask. Plus, you're going to get a lot more meat out of, you know, three pounds. bouncing around a little bit, but all the themes are overlapping. So moving from the beef roast yeah. into what we're going to do is a crown roast and a rack, the muscle fibers and cutting on the bias, those all still apply. I mean, when you turn the short, sure. the rack to the side, you can see those fibers, right. you moving along, you got the ribs, it all is consistent. We were talking now, Michael and Nick, not to exclude, exclude you, about tenderness versus toughness. Right. And we've covered this before, but I want to make sure everyone still has some good knowledge about it. Yeah. Tenderness and toughness is dictated largely by by how much the muscles use. Movement. Yeah, how absolutely. Much, how much fat you use to cover it and cook it. Totally right. Uh, so you can see this is as lean as the day is long. This is not. This is going to be a lot more forgiving. The margin for error a lot smaller with a the, with the cut like this. Uh, now, we talk about, you know, placement on the on the animal. This is in the middle. This is toward the end. This is a load-bearing muscle. So, you know, you can even stick your own shoulder out, and our shoulders are tough. Well, imagine if you were a 1,200-pound cow and you use this as load-bearing. Well, my shoulder's pretty tough. So, of course, you know, the back hip of a, a cow or the shoulder is going to be a very tough cut of meat. So the approach to cooking something like this starkly different from the approach to cooking something uh, along the lines of these three cuts, which are toward the middle of these uh, quadrupeds. And we can offset some of that by adding fat and liquid and you know, manipulating the cooking technique. And we're braising or stewing, or we're dry roasting, and we're you know, basically basting with some kind of, I would recommend, you could bard it or lard it. Yeah, yeah. or yes. maybe some tallow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Red pig fat, that might be in the case. You're adding, when you do that, you're all, Helping with the tenderness, but you're also adding flavor, so it all works together. And the fat helps insulate the heat, so it doesn't always escape the steam. It kind of goes back in and, you know, essentially steams the meat. Yes. So you're getting it a lot more tender when you have a lot more fat on top. Absolutely. And of course, we're not afraid of fat. Oh, of no, course, fat is delicious. That's right. So far, any questions about muscle structure, tenderness, cooking? Kind of covered a lot. Internal temperature for beef. Yeah. We're looking. Yeah. yeah, I. Once I would go 140. It's a it's a me. preference. You know, if you like to be really rare, then uh, the temperature at which you would pull it out would be a little lower. Um, when you, one, 135 to 140, I think with residual cooking time would give you a medium temperature. And when we think about cooking temperatures too, in terms of safety, it's going to vary a little bit across the board. Beef is much more forgiving in terms of a lower temperature that you can get away with. The pork, again, we want to bring that up to maybe 145, 147, 150, depending on how you're feeling. And that's going to be on the low end, where it's more medium rare to medium. If you're not comfortable with pork at that level yet, I would recommend getting a pork butt steak and taking it home <laughs> and trying it. It's delicious. But if you're not comfortable with that, yeah, bring it up more around 155 to 160. It'll Those still are, be delicious. Yeah, the recommended temperatures. The lamb and that big old beef rack down there, yeah. again, you can be a little more forgiving, medium what medium rare to medium. Going back to the turkey and the chicken, we want to be closer to that 165 mark. That's really when we're killing all bacteria and making sure it's a safe piece of poultry. Well, of course it can still be tender. Yeah. Cooked it at a low enough temperature. That's right, at a low temperature. Yeah. 
Low, low and slow, as long as it hits your target range, is right. acceptable. Is that, is that the same with uh, the right as well? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty the, much the same with any university across the board. You know, the lower and slower you cook it, the more time it gets to you know, steam and break yeah. down a little bit. The fat gets time, the polish gets time to fuse with the rest of the meat. Yeah. And it just gets tender and it's not overdone. So, I mean. And buy your tri tip fat on. Yeah. The, un the untrimmed tri tip. I feel like uh, has you know it's going to get dried out because most people put it on the barbecue. The barbecues are very volatile. I I couldn't recommend it more. Definitely untrimmed dry tip. It'll keep it moist. And then you know if you're squeamish with that, you can just take it off. Right. Sure. And I think at the heart of the question too is a lot of us are, go out to eat when we're talking about these ranges and we hear you know commercially and restaurant and industry wide we have to have certain temperatures and safety. That's also because we're looking at an environment that's more mass production. Right. We're doing a lot essentially because I've worked in restaurants, you're worried about people losing track of your orders and what cooking in the proper sequence, right? So if I'm doing five five steaks or six chickens and I'm not aware of what's being cooked at what time or what process, I need to hit a higher mark. I need to be at a very safe zone. So cooking for myself at home the threshold is usually considered four hours in a temperature danger zone between 141 and 140. But you can get away with a lower, slower cooking time because as long as you're heating that final temperature, you've, cooked, you've killed all the bacteria. So even if it takes six hours, you're still killing the bacteria up to the safe temperature zone. You're not worried about the four hours as much. And I mean, by health code standards, as long as something's brought above like 165, Correct. 30 seconds, everything's dead in there. Okay. So, yeah. Very brief. Okay. So, you know, so in order to make that cut taste like that cut, you add the fat. Yeah, I would take like uh, some beef lard, some yeah. like uh, call fat or something like yeah. that, and slice it really thin and yeah. spread it on top, and then tie your roast, and then cook it at like 315 to 325, right. and that'll give it time to break down a little bit more. It'll be like braising almost, but you're right. using the internal juices to right. cook itself. You know what we didn't hear here? What? Your credentials. Credentials? <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell them all where you've been studying and where you're going. Ah, well, I'm going to the Culinary Institute of America. I'm actually leaving for the NAPA campus in uh, January, January 2nd. And uh, I've got six more months left, and then I'm going to go work on pig farms for about right. five years. Absolutely. <laughs> so, the stuff, so the information that he's giving you is legit, and he's getting it from Absolutely. good sources. With that being said, because you talked about time, we've got good 55 minutes still class, and I think we can eat up all, all that 55 minutes with your demonstrations. So I'm going to uh, step out of the way. We'll get some questions going while you're doing it. We'll start on that. We'll let you do your thing, tying and crown roasting and using your instruments. I'll, I'll turn this down. So, okay, so start all sharp with me, man. Well, I want to remove a little bit of this right here first. Hold on. That's good and all, but this is a little too much right here. So why are you taking that off? It's just it's disproportionate with the rest of the roast. It's got a lot of veins and stuff in there. It's just not the top quality fat that I'd use. Call fat and the kidney fat is probably the tastiest, whereas this is in the intra or intramuscular. 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 So what he's talking about is um, the type of fat that he would use. Like, like you'd ask, you know, how do you get that place like this? Um, mentioning the the kidney fat, now the suet, as it's referred to on uh, cows, and it's referred to as leaf lard on pigs. It's the most pure fat. So when you're talking about fat off of a, uh, so that's all you really need to trim it down to. That. Right. You, you want, want that collagen because that's what's tasting, you know, the creaminess in the meat. When you get like a nice piece of roast beef and you hit a part piece of gristle, that's actually the chewy creaminess that, that you know, it's, you know, cooked. Right. So when you're looking for a fat to, uh, to put on a roast like this, just keep in mind kidney fat. It's the purest, it's the best tasting, and you can use it for it's a lot of It's got the most things. vitamins and minerals as well. Absolutely. We do have a little in the freezer, yeah, actually, yeah. if you want to check that out. You just pull a bag of that out, Jason. 
Yeah, and uh, on that note, we do sell that here. <laughs> the the kidneys. So the kidney is right here, right underneath the. Is this the plate? This is That's the, the off the loin. On the loin, right under the loin is the kidney, and surrounded by the surrounding the kidney is a large cluster of fat, and that's the soup. And well, it's to protect the kidney, and it's also to store all the extra nutrients around the kidney and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, you remove the kidney, and then you can take like a knife like this. If I get it untangled. And you just slice it really, really thinly. Is that like, can... like a long tube that was in, in the classical? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It is you very tube like. Yeah. Like, was it all ground? Pretty yeah, much, absolutely. Yeah. It's all ground. But, you, you know, can use the ground stuff as well if you just pack it onto the. Because you can see. It's very, it's very compact fat. And it's easy to use because you don't have to spend a whole lot of time trimming the lean off. Yes. You can be creative if you want to. I mean, honestly, in my opinion, pork fat is godlike. <laughs> yeah. So you can pretty much use that. Right it's now. it's definitely a preference thing. Um, you know, if you use beef fat on a beef roast, there's going to be a more uniform. Although I wouldn't profile. recommend using beef fat on pork. It's that just, yeah. Easy. I mean, it's, it's kind of like what is it? You use something? That's, uh, I don't know. I was going to say it's kind of like using. Uh, chicken stock and beef stew, you know, you, you could, do you really want to? I don't know. It's sort of like using duck fat if you're using, if you're cooking turkey or chicken. Right, yeah. which, I, which I actually, you know, highly recommend exactly. using duck fat for just about anything. Duck fat like pork fat, although pork fat over duck fat. Alright, well, let me show you how to tire this properly. You normally want to start on the thicker end, it's easier to taper off. So. Bring the string solidly underneath the roast. You want to get a basic butcher's twine, correct? Just basic butcher's twine. You want to get a really strong butcher's twine. We have had some problems in the past with this stuff snapping and me getting irritated, so let's hope that doesn't happen to die. I the cheap stuff. Great times What? This is just the first loop, so I mean you just need to get a basic knot line. So if you just check it out right here, I'm starting about, I don't know, an inch and a half away from the end of the roast. And I'll you know, give you a better view in a second. And then I pick it up, tie it around, and wrap it one, two times underneath. So now you got kind of like a double knot. Bring it center, bring it center, and cinch it up. Mike, we talked about that loop in the past. That's like yeah. a doctor. There's a lot of different names. I don't know. It's some boy scout knot they taught me in class. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And you want to get it as tight around as possible and then just wrap it around again and tie it off. And it didn't break. And that's one knot. And from now on, it really depends on how closely together you want your ties. The closer together, you're going to get more uniform. The farther apart, the less string you have to do, the less knots you have to do. Anyway, go ahead and turn this around, show you guys. Now, I want to shape this as much as possible, make sure the string is in the right spot and all. Bring adjusting that. Anyway, take string, one, two, bring it down, underneath. And put your right foot in. <laughs> and just cinch it up like that. Bring it around. Alright, and then check to see if it's nice and tight. See how I sort of use my fingers and pump it back and forth. You want it to be nice and tight so it stays uniform you know, during the cooking process. And when you continue tying knots and it's not nice and tight, the knots will slip and it'll get loose. Right. And Does it make shrink also? It's going to Yes. It's going to lose water volume. So you're kind of concentrating it, which is why dry aging helps. So you don't lose as much water volume. I forget, is that dry aged? This is dry aged? Yes, it is dry aged. 
All of our B pair is dry. Plus, it's got a darker, uh, darker color, and it's not see. so juicy. Normally, if I'd be, you know, playing with it, my hands would be getting wet and soggy, but my hands are kind of fatty and nice, and it's almost yeah. like a hand lotion. Yeah. So, uh, you know, aging, you can definitely just see. I mean, wet aged beef um, just looks a lot brighter. Um, the approach with wet aging is to retain moisture throughout the aging process. And dry aging is inducing moisture evaporation. And what that means is you get a more concentrated flavor profile. And also, when we stick that piece of meat on the scale, it's not full of water. A lot of the water is evaporated out, so it's uh, like it you're using out. chicken, and it says using natural flavors on there. Right. It's normally got some sort of water and salt injection into it, and that you will lose that during the cooking process. I mean, the salt will stay in there, but that's just you know seasoning, I guess, not salt. Also, well, yeah. Right. But this, we don't have the blood to pass. Right. Exactly. And those are uh, those are enzymes, and it's the same. You know, we're talking about muscle decomposition. Uh, it's just two different contexts. Do we want the muscle to decompose in its own enzymes, or do we want the muscle to decompose and let a lot of that moisture evaporate out? And uh, the meat is always stored in a humidity-controlled refrigeration. So yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this uh, this came off of a side of beef. You know, we, we break it all down right here, so no, this didn't come to us vacuum sealed or anything like that. It was uh, two pieces. And then it was rosy. <laughs> I mean, you get sides of beef over here that you cook with? That's right. We actually just got one recently, didn't we? Yeah, yesterday. So yes. that came in yesterday. And, um, you know, oh, it's, and it's then I wrap it around underneath, and you do kind of a crosshatch pattern over and under, over and under, to kind of get sort of a, you know, pull it, and what was it, I'm looking for, cinch it up? Cinch. Cinch it up, there you go. And then you brain fart on it. Once you get a nice bundle like that, now you can start taking off any herbs and exactly. sprays and then, just to finish it off, you bring it underneath the first part right here, and then down underneath the second part right here. I don't know if you can see that. Tighten it up nice. And then just kind of finish it off. There you go. There's your roast. Rub that with butter and stick some rosemary in there. You take your knife and poke little holes, and you can pop a little bits of garlic in there, and then just cover it with fat. You're good. Kidney fat. Kidney fat. Just salt and pepper. Well, salt and pepper. Like poking the holes in it, putting garlic. I really used to do that. Yeah, and then it also Isn't helps. Are you discouraged from doing that now because you let the juices out of the meat? No, 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 no. When you're poking the holes, you're actually helping tenderize it as well. You don't want to poke holes after the cooking process That's the difference. because that'll release the juices and stuff. That's the difference. Beforehand, it's okay to kind of beat the little crap out of it. So. And so that's, <laughs> that takes us to the beginning of the conversation here about where we're going to put our thermometer. And that's you want to be definitive about that because you don't want to have six different holes that we poke in here to get a temperature because that's when the juices will leak out. And you definitely want those. And normally, to stay. you only want to take like two or three readings. Right. You don't want to use the same place. So, you know, you, you take your temperature when you think it's almost done, and then maybe like five minutes afterwards, right. and then after it's rest for 10 minutes. Okay. Anyway. That looks great. Sounds good, man. What about time and temperature? Time and temperature? Yeah. Well, considering it's such a thick piece, I'd honestly say, you know, 310, 315, and then just leave it in there until it reads 145. I mean, I can't really how say long? how long. How long am I going? I'm not, I'm not as good as this. Four, what is that? This is probably four and a half, five minutes. Yeah. I'm not good at this part yet. <laughs> Six pounds almost. Six pounds. 
I'd go north of 15, pound, 15 minutes per pound. For them? Yeah, yeah. That's a very minimum for uh, 15 minutes a pound. This is pretty tough. You know, this is off of a uh, off of the round, which we pointed out is back here. It's a load bearing muscle. It's uh, it's not going to do well in a, in a short cooking time. And I mean, you can always you got to get the nice crunchy glazy crust and put it like. 25 or 10 15 minutes first, and that'll really right. start. Especially if you've got that fat cap on there that we talked about, you know, using you know, the high temperature, maybe even the broiler at the onset, kind of bubble up some of that fat, make it look really nice. That's a really popular thing you do with the, with the prime rib or the standing rib roast, is to let this sit under the broiler for a few minutes so that fat can kind of start to bubble up. Have your coarse salt on here, uh, really makes for a nice presentation. Excellent flavor. Oh, delicious. So, in the context of a fat cap, as it's referred to, hot oven to begin it, and then back down the temperature for the duration. So, you would ground it on all sides and then put it together? That's certainly something That's, you can do. It's, well, it's more of a braising technique, really. Right. But, I mean, honestly, you just want to get that initial brownness on top, and then you can just leave it there. Because the flavor will transfer, the flavor will transfer throughout. It's just you want to get that initial crust. Yeah. yeah. The surface area you have with that deep yeah. crust right now lends a lot of flexibility flavor creation as well. You could do something like a um, brown sugar coffee rub, right? Where it's going to get some more of that flavor imparted, some more caramelization. You could do a fresh herb rub. Yeah. There's a lot of different things you can use to buy in that roast that's going to really saturate the meat in a really good way. So, uh, all, you know, all I really did here was, um, I don't have tin bones, so I can't make this into a proper crown roast. Uh, I have, this is all the pork that I have left, actually. So, until tomorrow, I won't have enough. Uh, but I think something I want to mention here is that, you know, getting in, into doing some of these things, like maybe tying the roast yourself, of course, we're happy to do it. Uh, we're happy to fringe the bones down. But, of course, we, we have to mark up for this kind of stuff because we've got to cover our labor. So, you know, it's like anything else. If you become comfortable with these types of things, you can save yourself a little money in the long run instead of... It's not that difficult to do, really. I it's mean, not it's just, difficult at all to do. Um, the same thing here, you know, a very popular thing to do with the standing rib roast or prime rib is to is to cut this meat off the rib bone and season the inside and truss it back up. And, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of tying knots because what we do when we cut this back off the off the uh, off the bones and just follow the fat seam. We get in there, we put some seasoning in, and then we just truss back up. We just truss it back up in the fat in between each bone. And again, this is something that you know yeah, just it's something that we or, or any other butcher out there is gonna be more than happy to do for you, but you know, you can tie a knot. Do it yourself. It's just that simple, you know, one under and then two knots and then just simple, simple. And then it's, uh, then everybody will think, oh my gosh, what have you done? It's Where, amazing. Where'd you learn how to do all that? And then you just see that across every bone. So, you know, the more you just kind of, uh, and you know, take on the race like that, it's going to be a lot more even. The bone to go with again. That's exactly right. Mike, what's the benefit of crunching? What's the purpose of crunching? Presentation. Looks. Yeah, it's just presentation. You can put and little French hats on each yeah. one if you want to. Yeah. I, I mean, it's good. you know, I'm not gonna, you know, talk bad about presentation. It's 90 percent, right? I mean, that's what we're told in this industry. Uh, for my money, I probably would have left this on. Uh, it, it really is a presentation thing. And you know what, Sometimes there's a time and a place for that. I just don't find myself in those types of places. And I mean, like, we can use this stuff now for sausage. No, but absolutely. Home, I mean, well, you can you make do? sausage with right. that. And so you're going to buy, if you're going to buy However, however, if you're doing your pork crown roast, and this is, uh, you know, you need ten bones, first of all, to do a proper crown roast. These, these ends, you know, even if we trim this meat back, these aren't, these ends are not going to be, you know, it's just going to be a mess. It might be, um, but 
but this would have value as as part of maybe your stuffing that you're going to put in the middle. Diced up finely with some onions, carrots, and celery. You've got your stuffing meat right there. So where Sausage. Would you, where would you make it? If you were going to turn that into a crown roast, yeah. just, can you describe what you would do? To... Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, just cut a little farther into the loin itself, and that's just going to allow us to the bend it. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good point. Uh, this chine bone here would come off, um, and tomorrow morning it will come off. We'll end up doing, you know, this, this roast can be done as a um, as a straight roast like that, or you know, with the additional bones uh, as a crown roast. And again, it's presentation. That's really what we're talking about. I think the pork crown roast is probably the most awesome presentation that can be done with meat. I mean, even. Even the prime rib roast. I don't know, it's turducken is pretty cool. <laughs> turducken is <laughs> It is pretty cool. So that's all that we would do there is, is just cut down into the loin a little bit. But we wouldn't go into the actual eye, which is which is this muscle here. Um, that's really going to be part of your presentation when you get it finished. And maybe that's the next thing we can talk about here is, is if you have a bone-in roast, either of these will actually fit the description. When you're done cooking, you've got to get the bone out of there. And fat seams are, are how you find out how to do that. We talk about it all the time here when we're breaking beef or, or cutting pork or, or whatever it is, the piece that you're trying to take off wants to come off. These rib bones want to come off. All you have to do is find the fat seam. And you know, when it's cooked, it's going to be even more identifiable. So you're really just going to try and take these bones off by cutting as close as you can to the eye without taking any of the actual eye off. Because once these ribs are off, well then we just slice them like we would stick. And you can help with that during the cooking time by just beforehand slicing down each rib bone right. and it will break through this collagen layer right here. And then later you can just kind of peel them out and pop them out afterwards. Yeah. So you don't have to deal with the yeah. fat and collagen. And you can, you know, suck all the meat off of them. That's what I would call it. Any questions about that? Excellent. So we've covered red meat. Uh, people do prepare poultry as well. You know, turkeys and things like that. Um, all my turkeys are kind of frozen right now. So we don't really have the means to do any type of presentation in that regard. Uh, but, you know, we talk here a lot about just knowing the basics, and if you know the basics, then it doesn't matter what you're going to end up doing, even if it is, you know, something that is uh, poultry or fowl. We should do a horribly obscene bird boning <laughs> stomach we demonstration. Have, we have, absolutely. Turducken? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, really? Oh, that was a great demonstration. That must have been awesome. I'm so good. sad I missed that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. That's the one we got in trouble for. <laughs>
talk a little bit about um, the actual meal and the utensils. So as Nick mentioned earlier, you want to make sure your knives are really sharp. Although I have one and my family has used them in the past, I'm not an advocate just based on um, old world style of an electric knife. So I've, to each their own, if you choose to use an electric knife, they can be very efficient. But there's also a certain level of yeah, carving knives are might be the way to go. One, if you're doing it table side, it looks damn cool because you got your nice carving knife and you're showing people your confidence and your skill. But also, when you look at an electric knife and the design of an electric knife, there are two blades pinned together. Correct? You can take them apart, you can clean them, but they're two blades pinned together. So what ends up happening is the motion is a sawing motion side to side. That's how you get a lot of that fibrous, those little ground up bits at the end. Okay, so that doesn't help the presentation. But also you'll notice you'll get, just like a saw through wood, a circular saw through wood, you'll get little striations, a little cross pattern in the meat. To me, that's not a, a great presentation either. Everyone eats with their eyes first. And then they eat with their nose and their olfactory second, because that initial visual and then the smell tells the body and the palate what's coming. When you look at the meat, especially when we're talking about poultry, like turkey breast, chicken breast, if you're using that electric knife, you're gonna get a little zigzag pattern down the meat, it just doesn't look great. I prefer a great carving knife. Um, Nick, you were sharpening earlier. Can you show them a little bit about a good technique for keeping yeah. a knife sharp and maintain? Well, you're gonna need a large bowl of water to get most of these are not soaked anymore. But you want me to grab one for you? Um, no, I think I'm just going to go over the basic technique. Okay. I'm not really going to actually sharpen because they're already pretty sharp. And how frequently should you be making, keeping your knives? It depends how often you use them. Some of them you only need to sharpen like once a year. Some of them you need to sharpen every week or something like that. I mean, for me, I don't sharpen my knives. I sharpened my knives recently for the first time in a month. First time That's because I'm lazy. <laughs> now, for the initial, let's say I have my butcher knives at home and I haven't sharpened them or maintained them for six weeks. I'm not privy to it. I didn't know I should be doing it. Should they be taking them to a place where they get them professionally sharpened first? You can take them to first? a knife shop and get them professionally sharpened and it'd be good. Unless you want to invest, you know, like 20 bucks in a, what is this, 200, 400 stone, which is, you know, grip per square inch, I think. When you say 200 or 400, you can see actually the different This is the finer size. side, and this is the coarser so side. Block. So this right here is really good for starting a new edge. Um, so if you have like a really old beat up knife, you want to take this side, you know, soak this in water for 20 minutes, and then put it on a towel, paper towel to wet it, and just grind it. So the motion you're going to want to be going in so much to explain about this at the same time. Anyway, <laughs> it really depends on what task you're going to be using the knife for. If you're something like a chef knife, you want more of a uh, wide angle. So you're going to put the knife at a more slant towards the stone, and you're going to want to get that angle so it's more obtuse like that. And that's going to stay sharp longer. It's not going to be as sharp say a clay knife or something like that, but you're not going to have to sharpen it as much. So like a chef knife that you use every day, just go boom, 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 boom. That's like a standard six or eight inch chef knife. Exactly. Knife. I mean, honestly, I spend 10, 15 minutes on a blade, but that's because I'm obsessive. And uh, grind it until you have a good uh, uh, angle like that. But that's, you know, chef knife. When you're grinding, are you going back and forward or only back? Well, I mean, I've kind of developed my own technique of uh, start right here at the edge of the knife right here. Go down one, back, down, back. Almost keeping, like a zigzag or a double. Exactly, here. keeping the knife flux. You got it's like a surgeon hand, I guess. You don't want to you don't want to be shaking or else you destroy the knife blade. Honestly I suggest just taking it to a professional. I mean, I've been doing this a while. I do this for a living. Michael forces me to do it. Something I have to do, but uh, I I personally have school knives, but I also have shun. I have one of those over there is mine. I don't know if I'm getting it out. Uh, 
definitely something you should probably either really learn how to do or go to a professional because a really nice sharp knife is good. And it's not too expensive to go get one sharpened There's once you find a good knife shop. And I think you hopefully you'll agree. Downtown, I believe they have like there's there's a knife store and they give out business cards for someone who sharpens knives. Yeah, the guy goes around. His name's Gary. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, he used to do it there all the time, but then he got retired. So he yeah, you can find him yeah. in the farmers market yeah. and out yeah. the mall and a couple places. Yeah. Um, and honestly, find a cook in your family and buy them knife stones and give them knives to sharpen. It's a good good plan. Yeah, and I, I think you'll agree, and if not, hopefully. Doesn't come off too awkward. For knives, my house, I like a solid, either solid handle like Nick has here, where the blade is encased, or a, a blade where the tine and everything is basically molded and pressed together. Um, yeah, this one's encased nicely, but there's some that are out there that are plastic, you know, handled, and if you can see where the blade is raised above the handle, it's not fused well. Those are very cheap. The key is to invest in a good knife that's balanced well in the hand, so it doesn't feel uncomfortable or awkward. It should be kind of like an extension of you. So you have a nice balance and weight to it where you feel that you're going to get a good slicing motion and be in control. But honestly, as long as the knife is sharp, yeah. you can really just use whatever. Um, make sure they're a good quality knife and that they're sharp. Um, once you've got that nice edge, you've gone through the initial grinding, you got to maintain it. Motion is the same, right? The and then, you know, I go on to the 1000 stone, but this is just kind of icing on the cake. It's a really nice sharp edge. And then, best friend in the kitchen right here. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice, good for another week and a half. Well, not a week and a half. You gotta do that every day, you know, occasionally when you sharpen. And it just, what you're doing with this is you're straightening the edge of the knife. So with these, you're creating an edge. And every time you cut something, every time you slice through something, you're bending that edge, you're breaking that edge slightly. So what you're doing with this is you're just kind of realigning it, making it sharp again. You don't have to sharpen it every you know week and a half as long as you're taking care of it with your steel. It's pretty interesting. At a microscopic level, if you look at it, it ends up being like a, a wood saw, an old yeah, school wood saw. Jagged. Like the teeth the become microphone. misaligned. There's actually little cuts kind of rolled plate. up. And that's what the steel is doing. It's pushing those edges back together in alignment and until you have to grind it again. Exactly. And the reason that the knife is so sharp when you get those like, Japanese sushi knives is when you look on them at a microscopic level, it's just one solid straight line. And it just slices through everything. Whereas, you know, a cheaply sharpened knife, it looks more like, you know, one of those creepy movie, you know, messy. Hacks off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Personally, I have carbon. I mean, would you mind fetching my knife? I, I could show them what I fetch my knife. Fetch my knife, so This is my personal baby. It was my Christmas present to myself. Rather expensive knife. This one right here is $130 right here. And that's but, also uh, the layered pressed steel, right? Yeah, it's uh, dichro. No, not dichro. It's uh, carbon steel. It's holds an edge very nicely. So that's where some a stone like this is, use, is useful because I can create those really fine edges and it won't bend and break easily like it does with the stainless steel knife. And I can really maintain it with the steel. But I mean, when you've got a stainless steel knife like this, you really only need a two and a stone to sharpen yourself. But as far as an investment goes, you know, just because you're Sometimes they get sharpened over there. 
Questions so far? I mean, we're, we're jamming you full of as much information as we can tonight. So, let's talk about side dishes a little bit. Who's, well, let me ask this first. What are you planning on cooking for the holiday? Are you cooking for the holiday? I don't think so. I don't think so? You're going to let someone else do the work? I think so. I'm waiting for an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll put it in the mail. Chuck, how about you? Should we cook it? Is there a typical dish? Is there something that she makes every year that you look forward to? Well, what we usually have is ham for Christmas. Ham for Christmas? Yeah. Excellent. Well, that just to derail us for a second, as typical, ham is a, a good discussion because it falls well, similar true. when we're looking at the roasting techniques and that slow cook that we talk about the roast on the counter on the butcher's block. It applies to the ham. When we're talking about the slicing and electric knife and the, the grain and everything, it applies to the ham as well. So universally, there are a lot of techniques and things that we can apply to different cuts of meat in different styles. Dave, do you have something typical and regular? No, no, no. I mean, lots of times turkey, but they always have a group for different types of sides. The reason no is an awesome answer for me is because it, there are a lot of different things that people focus in on. The prime prime rib, prime roast that we were talking about, is a very common Christmas kind of focus. A lot of people will use that um, as their focal point. It can be French, it can be crown, um, but that is a very typical Christmas kind of roast. On the flip side, in the poultry area, there's a turkey sometimes, but there's also the goose, kind of the stereotypical goose dinner. Michael can get used if it's desired. It's a specialty item. Yep. Um, requires a little more care and attention. But I, duck. duck, I think, is probably a more manageable bird for people at home than a goose. This is just larger, that's all. It's, it's the same fat type, it's the same fill of flavor. Sure, it's just bigger. bigger. It's a lot bigger. No, I'd agree with that. Duck are four pounds. It's intimidation factor, goose, though. 12 pounds. You know, the good goose is just is smiling at us. I don't, I don't think that's the best part. I mean, I don't think there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. You mentioned, though, um, kind of typical potatoes and everything. Side dishes that are on the holidays largely, from my experience and observation, come from a historic preference. Okay, what is your family brought to the table on a regular basis? Not too many people are going to deviate regularly year to year with their side dishes and their meals. The, especially Christmas, is a very nostalgic kind of holiday. People like to reminisce a lot about their childhood and you know, the experiences with their grandparents or going over to their aunt and uncle's house every year. So when you look at what's going to bring the best bang, I think if you're entertaining a good large group or a large family, take a poll. Ask them what they remember. You know, for me personally, Thanksgiving, it's always green bean casserole and uh, you know, some kind of sweet potato my, and the stuffing, right? So those are the big three for me. Watching the Detroit Lions lose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's a tradition my family. Uh, all right. Poor Detroit Lions. They, they cost me this week. Well, they broke, the, they, they broke that trend this year. Yeah, they, they cost me this past week. <laughs> um, but taking a good poll with your family and saying, what would you like to see? Obviously, if you're entertaining, you want to be manageable. You don't want to end up with seven or eight side dishes, try to accommodate everyone. But things like a, a very basic cranberry relish, you know, elicits that fresh, tangy, vibrant um, kind of Christmas feel. When we were talking about the roast and how to season it up once it's wrapped and tied up. And rosemary and those fresh herbs will elicit a, an aroma and a great smell to the house in general. And then you can match like to like uh, broth and potatoes along with yeah. that. Uh, any flavor pair, yes. It's a, a good thing to, to focus in on because you want those dishes to complement each other. So the gratin potatoes, potatoes, getting a rich, creamy, cheesy kind of focus and that nutty earthiness to the potato, it's going to go great with that rich, irony, bitter, beef roast. Mm -hmm. And that you're making me hungry now. I don't know that. Every time I get so talking, I'll get on a roll. I'll get on a roll. <laughs> um, the other thing that I personally love when I'm dealing with big roasts like that, especially if we're going to go that medium rare to medium and slice it thin, is some kind of smashed or mashed potato. And 
so many carbs, dude. Yeah. Considering we're like at a paleo friendly <laughs> weird environment, <laughs> come on, man. You're misrepresenting us. <laughs> it is my fault, kind of. Bro. Or a great mac and cheese. For two reasons. <laughs> One, again, there's a richness to it that matches the great with the heartiness of the meat. Yeah. But two, after the initial presentation of a beautiful little amount of potatoes and meat, the juices start to melt. Okay, so you're bringing those flavors of the two dishes together in the same plate. That's what I'm about. Yes. I have one more question. You're slicing the meat very thin after it's rested. Yes. Well, it cools quickly that way. It does. What's the secret to have hot food on the plate? Yeah. So the keep the oven at 180 degrees. That's the hot oil temperature. The plates and you can put your plates in the oven and then also put like a roasting pan in there with aluminum foil on top. And slice the meat. Well, you know, a lot of people slice the meat beforehand and pile it up in there. About just put a slice, slice half of it, and then you can get a half next to it and put it in the oven with the foil on top, still 180 degrees, and it'll hold there. It won't. It'll hold. It'll cook a little bit if you keep it in there for like a couple hours. That's what they do a lot in the restaurants. Is they have Queen Marys that are held at like 165, 180 degrees, just to keep that temperature up enough. Food safe, yeah. not to cook it too much. And if you're just going to finish it like three hours before you serve it, then you can hold it in there and dump it at like 170, 180. And if, and you're, if you're real slick and you work your timing out to where you're serving close to guests arriving or seating, you want a solid, I would say, 20 to 30 minutes of rest on that road oh, yeah. before you slice. Because that's what's going to allow those juices to draw back in. People Very think, important. oh, I'll take the roast out, I'll let it sit for 10 minutes, I'll slice it. You're going to lose a lot of juice and a lot of flavor by that short of a duration of resting. And the larger the roast, the longer time it is. Because, I mean, it's just contains so much. Imagine, like, putting a rock in a fire. I mean, it's going to retain more heat, but the larger it is, it's going to retain okay. longer. Yeah, recovery. So, I mean, it just needs more time to kind of even out temperatures throughout the entire piece of meat. And if you've cooked it to, if we're talking about beef roast, and you've cooked it to medium rare, slice it thin, you want to hold it. You can also do a quick dunk in a beautiful au jus right before service. That would give it a quick heat, and it'll also impart a lot of concentrated flavor. Not a bad idea. Especially all those pan drippings that are coming off of that roast and it's cooking, you can filter that. I mean, even if you do, let's say you've got a large group, you can prep that roast the day before. And you can hold it overnight. All that fat stuff that's going to rest on top of the au jus, you can skim it and make yourself a nice, great gravy or sauce. Heat it all back up, slow warm the roast back again the next day, and as you slice it, a little dunk of the juice is going to freshen it up and make it really vibrant. And with something like that, I mean, to sort of bring it up at such a low temperature, cooking it twice would almost, you know, make it more tender, softer. Yeah. Especially with the roast and heat high. You know. yeah. Especially, yeah, especially with something like that. Better, but what ends up happening is as it, after you cooked it the first time, as you mentioned, all that collagen and fat and juice sort of and soak back up, you let it rest. As it cools, that stuff expands again. Yes. When you think about a liquidized fat, say I'm cooking bacon and I throw liquid in the pan and I put it in a grandma's old coffee cup on the stove, yes. the next day it's congealed, it's gone back to more of a solid form. There's a certain level of expansion. So in that roast, in the refrigerator overnight, as those juices and that collagen and fat expand a little bit more in the muscle fiber, it's kind of stretching, it's breaking it down. There's a certain amount of tenderization that's happening, tenderizing. There's only six days left. You still have time to plan. That's another tip. You've never waited too long, as long as you've got a great idea to catch back up with. If you have time right now, six days, if you want to cook a roast or cook a, a nice meal for the holiday, you can do that. All the ingredients are available. It doesn't even have to be for the holidays. Whenever you want, a good meal. You know, well, that's a good point. <laughs> Everybody's on a budget. Roasts are the way to go. Roasts yeah. and raising are my favorite meat. Yeah. Shanks, yeah. rounds, shoulders, claws. That's totally it's right. And you know, the, the industry, they've done such a good job at marketing steaks. Uh, you know, I need some steaks. Well, that's not cheap. You know, for a family of five, a chuck roast. You know, you could probably get three or four meals out of that. And uh, it's a lot lower maples as well. You know, the crock pot, what an asset that is in the 
engine. So you can you can spend less money, you can get more volume, uh, set it, forget it. We're so big on roasts here in a big, big way. Bones too, dude. Bones, yes, make broth. It's well, the same thing. Take on the labor, you'll save money. Sure. You reference the shank. The shank is a great alternative for the hot. If you're focusing in on the holiday, you don't want to do a big beef roast. A nice, um, also buko or a shank. You do the same kind of concentrated flavor and results, tenderness. Just take a whole bone and shank and put yes. it in a pot with some stock. Yes. A little brandy on top, some carrots and celery. Leave it in there for five Cheap. hours. You're good. Cheap. Cheap. Run more okay. brandy. Either yeah. one works. <laughs> that was a lot. That was a lot. You got that off? What's the next series? The next series is in production, behind the scenes, in terms of what we have our content, getting the, the format in order. We will be, we'll be relaunching another wave of first cut after the first of the year. And I think we're going to be focusing more on hard demo like this. Um, like we did tonight, but even more similar to what we did with the Breaking Down Your Beef class. We're going to have larger cuts of meat, and we're showing you more detail about the movement and um, how that handshake works, and why it translates to search cut and search cooking technique. So I think we're going to get into more of a micro level of the Breaking Down Your Beef um, concept. Right? We'll show you. I'm sorry? Yes. There will be more webcasts as well. So. Um, what we're going to do is try to enlarge the audience, but also give you better education on the actual meat itself, getting you closer to the source of what you bought in the case. That's right. Do you ever get to where you have classes where you can get pants on? You know, my insurance guy, yeah. not like that at all. We've, <laughs> talked, we've talked about that, but we talked a, about it. It's just, um, the, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely it's not those on, proper training things. Definitely not on a webcast. Yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> Could be to a local community adult school. Yeah. See, and that's why Deborah is a valuable asset to the <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No, but that's a good idea. We could reach out, um, and we may reach out to the adult school, because we do want to get you, as a community, more confident. And that's part of the, the whole yeah. premise and the name of the First Cut series, is you taking your first cut at home as well, having the confidence to say, I now have, at the very minimum, a base knowledge of what to do with the beef roast. How I can cut it, cook it, cut it, and serve it. Or maybe I want to get a little fancier and I can start working on crunching my pork roast and providing that as a presentation. And honestly, I mean, there are a lot of videos on YouTube as well. Oh, if you want to take, you know, something, you know, buy cuts of meat and break them down yourself, you can watch a demonstration of how to on YouTube up on and then you can just do it at home. I mean, it's not as much fun as being here. That's true. That's true. It, it, it isn't. No, Although at home, if I have like a lamb or something like that, oh man, I'm having the time of my life. You're a rare bird though. Yeah, well, I'm an interesting person, I guess. <laughs> now, why would I, as a home cook, want to know how a whole side of beef is slaughtered? I just come to see you and you tell sure, me. Sure, no, and, and to be honest with you, uh, I don't really want you to. I want, right. you pay, I want you to pay me to do that, no doubt about it. Right, right, and that's a valid point. But knowing where it comes from is true, sure. I guess. I well, think backing up in terms of terminology as well, um, even with this class, when we think of the, the slaughter, we're not, we don't want to devalue the role of your local butcher shop or a local butcher in general, but it also, be, as a more educated consumer, yeah. you're able to come in and ask for uh, different cuts for the more poignant direction. Yeah or you're able to translate that into your own cooking at home. Because you'll understand a little bit of the structure, and you'll say, you know what, this is the application. I want to do I want to do wet cooking tonight, or I want to do dry cooking, or I want to go steak versus roast, or I want to do shank, and also buka with a great um, concentrated nutrition in the marrow bone, where I want to extract that. And so for me, personally, the reason why I like these kind of uh, concise classes because it makes me more educated consumer. That's it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. That way, and I think that's, we've talked about this before, we've had this debate um, numerous times about the, the kind of blinder effect. The, I don't, I want to see what's on the styrofoam and underneath the plastic wrap with the price tag. Okay. Right. Um, what's this going to cost me? 
and how am I going to cook it? Right. Not where did that steak come from on the, the cow, or how was that cow raised, and what's that mean to my nutrition? Right. So getting you closer to that, that meat and to that animal will allow you to have a not only appreciation of the table, but a better um, understanding. Yeah, understanding. It's about base knowledge. I mean, it's like we said when we put all four of these roasts out here. They, they're very different, but they have they have similarities. And the more you understand about muscle structure, and these animals all walk around on four legs, and you know, understanding the anatomy of a cow will help you understand the anatomy of a pig and the anatomy of a lamb. And it's not so much about cutting out the middleman, so to speak, as it is being more informed and, and making informed decisions when you make a purchase, uh, being more informed when you're in your kitchen, and you know. The food budget is the food budget. We want to make it go as far as possible. Knowing as much as you can about the food that you're buying, even if it's not meat, vegetables, you know, cereal. So long uh, story short, it's just time and money. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to uh, make better decisions purchasing and preparing. And in contradiction to the natural inclination, it actually strengthens the partnership with the butcher. Because yeah. you have that under base understanding, you can ask questions or provide information to them. Because, as we all know, eating is not just the nourishment, and it's not just an entertainment. It's all those things bound together. I want to nourish my body in a healthy way. I want to flavor-wise just enjoy it. I want to share it. Yes. I want to just you know, pass that information or that experience on. So it's a whole bundle of experience. When we go out, that's why we want to dine at another establishment. Sometimes we want the creativity from the chef, or we want to share the experience with friends at the table. All those things come into play, and the more information you have as a consumer, both purchasing and physically eating, the better your experience is going to be. Whether it's at home with just your significant other by yourself, or out with a group of friends. And when we're talking with meat, that butcher and that relationship you have with them is integral. So the more information you have and the more information he has, the better the product, the better the delivery at home or with friends. And again, when we get down to the cost factor, the better you're able to leverage your dollar. Absolutely. You got, I'm kind of curious about uh, the liver fat you're talking about. So uh, that, kidney fat. Kidney yes. fat. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Because like you just, I would say, I'm buying a piece yeah. of brown. Uh -huh. I'd say, Do you have some beef some, fat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we we grind meat. it up a lot of times. Um, we put it because we have customers that like to buy it already ground up because they're going to go home and just render it down into tallow which is good as a cooking oil. Um, so this would be unrendered. And yeah, you just ask us for some uh, for some beef fat, some suet. We usually keep it, some of it ground in the freezer, but we always have some that's, that's not ground up in the refrigerator. And yeah, we just... But honestly, right the ground up might be easier because you just let it come up to room temperature, just press it on to the top of a cut of meat, and it'll just form on top. Yeah, the ground might work out better in that instance. You'd have to let it sit out on the counter for a little while, though, because beef fat is rigid, especially the suet fat. And the suet is the terminology. I mean, when, we're, when it's in the cavity, suet is the name that most people recognize it by. The rendering we've talked about in the past in your tallow, and it's like clarifying butter, essentially. You're taking yeah. that, that kidney fat and you chop it up. You can actually do it in the crock pot. You know, put it on a very slow and low heat, similar to raising the cooking meat. And as that fat melts down, then you can strain it through a cheesecloth. And it's basically, you're pulling out any impurities. You want to clarify that kidney fat and suet into a nice, creamy, white cooking fat. It's the same thing you do with lard, except you get little crackles of lard. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, going back to that, that brown stick, you can tie it up. You suggest to put fat on it. Yeah. So after you tie it up, you have to cover have that with the so that should be the last step. Because that's okay. you're sealing out all the flavor and the juices. So you salt it, you season it, you rub it, you know, pound it, you beat it, you stab it, you know, and then you cover it with fat and put it in. So here we have just, we have some of the fat right here. And as you can see that's chamber. Yeah, just about. Uh, <laughs> but there is no lean here at all. Yes, it, is. it looks like fish food almost. It's totally fat. This is frozen, so it's going to be pretty rigid. But even refrigerated, it's going to be it's firm. It's going to be pretty firm. So, in order to use it in that in that context, 
you're going to need to let it sit out on the counter for a little while. And also, since it's fat, there's not as much chance of it spoiling. Yes. It's, you know, things don't really look like fat. They don't. They actually found uh, Riettes, which is, you know, meat that's covered in rabbit fat. It was 200 years old and still edible. No one ate it once, but uh, fat theory. keeps everything theory. out. Theory. Mother Nature has a layer. Right here. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we always have tons of this. When you break beef the way that we do, you get a surplus of bones and fat. We always have bones, we always have fat. The only way to transfer bones into tallow and stock constantly. I would, I would be doing that every day. I mean, I'll open it in stock. Yeah, absolutely. Depends on what it is. Now we're sold out of the prime rib. We're sold out of beef tenderloin. I mean, it, you know, we do buy from smaller ranches. You know, there's two ribs on a cow. Something like we didn't plan ahead. Yeah, that that's and now also like New Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we can help you. Round is always good. You know, top round is always good for us. I mean, low and slow, like I said. Yeah. You can you can get some good cuts of meat. They're good. Serveable dishes that are just brown and chuck as long as you Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the rib roasts, I mean, that stuff got scooped up really fast. There's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I'm going to go over to Hill's house. There you go. There you go. Everybody's going to Doug's. Yeah, he's got, he's got a corner. Everybody's going to Doug's house. Yeah, it, and it, you know, it's an interesting conversation because, you know, prime rib, which was the big roast on the end there, that's the one that everybody thinks of and, and seeks out. and. You know, when we get into sustainability, it's a different conversation, and we definitely surprise some people. We sold out on Tuesday, uh, prime ribs, and uh, we That's had. What you what's that? When are you gonna get more? Uh, well, till after Christmas, uh, and it is a stockpiling scenario. They had to start stockpiling uh, before Thanksgiving, and we have to use sales data from previous years to figure out how many we're going to need, how many cows he's going to produce. Like I said, there's two of those ribs on on one cow, um, so it's surprising to some people who've never shopped here before to come in and say, "Hey, I'd like to order some prime rib." Say, "Well, we're all sold out." <laughs> what do you mean? How can that possibly be? Right, and, and, and that kind of goes back to your question about why would I want to know a little bit more about the animal? Right, it's having an appreciation that. Like we've talked about in the past, tenderloins and tricep. Yeah. Cow only has so many of them. That's right. So and when you go, go into like mom's or something like that, you see 30 prime ribs. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was 15 cows in one location <laughs> that had right. to be slaughtered to make that happen. Because yes. only two rows. You know, it's about perspective. So I need a freezer. So when you see like the right yeah, there you go. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. But that you know, one thing that we're trying to do more here is is to kind of direct people into different cuts. It's very popular, but there are, you know, ten other roasts on a cow that can accommodate the same scenario. Uh, on, on one of these grass-fed steers, there's probably six pounds of tricep on a cow, on one cow. Uh, so when we get to the weekend, you know, and we get all this tricep in, it's a difficult uh, thing to explain to, to people in just a in a retail setting. You know, it's do you have tricep? No. Okay, I'm going somewhere else. But hang on, there's a story here, you know. So uh, it's just a different uh, approach to selling it and getting into holidays and things like that makes it even more challenging because the ranches that we buy from, they do have to stockpile and they do have to... Uh, well, I'm make, sure you're not going to buy them from them. Generally not. Uh, the ranches we buy from are small, but I'm sure that we're not the only ones that are selling meat to. We had, uh, from one of our ranches, the open space meats, they were able to give us 20 roasts. And there's seven bones on each roast, so that's 140 bones to sell. And this, this is a good one. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. I think next year we've got to find another ranch, though, you know, David. Because we've, we've been having to give quite a few people some bad news. But just over the past couple of days. And all this weekend. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel terrible, Michael? It really, really does. It's hard to say no. <laughs> 
I digress. Anything else? No, um, before you guys leave, again, there's marketing materials on the table for food share. Uh, if you're interested in getting some more of that, you're all on my email list now, so as we get more events coming out, we'll, get, we'll make sure that information is out to you. I would also like to send everyone home with a holiday gift in case. So, yeah, Michael and I are going to take a little look and see real quick. Don't run off too quickly. Um, we're going to maybe some bacon. I'm not sure yet. Let me take a minute to collaborate with Michael. But I do want to send you home yeah. a little holiday present right. and appreciation for you coming tonight. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.